So this image is one image that's going to show the exact recycling of iron. So how the iron is recycled. So this image what you are given is a typical example of an RES that is reticular endothelial system otherwise called as monocyte macrophage system. So monocyte macrophage system is a per se a very big system which includes a lot of monocytes and macrophages scattered out throughout the body in different places but we are not going to details about all those things. But what happens in the reticular endothelial system? There are four processes by which the RES can get iron. The first way is through the senescent RBCs. The first way is through the senescent RBCs. These senescent RBCs undergo a process called erythrophagocytosis. Because of the erythrophagocytosis, this RBCs will be taken up and will be ripped apart. They will be ripped apart inside the erythrophagosome. And once the RBCs are ripped apart inside the erythrophagosome, we are going to uh, push heme and globin. Obviously, you know very well this globin is going to degraded further into amino acids which can be further recycled. But what about this heme that is formed within the erythrophagosome? Yes, this heme is going to be again transported out of the erythrophagosome by a transport protein which, which is what we are going to call it as something called a HRG that's called heme regulatory protein, heme regulatory compound 1 or heme regulatory gene 1 and its product that's a protein. HRG means heme regulatory gene. So that's going to transport and once heme is outside the erythrophagosome, it follows the same principle which we've been discussing innumerable times, it's going to be acted upon by heme oxygenase which is further going to convert into Fe2 plus bilivadin carbon monoxide. This bilivadin and carbon monoxide further under the action of bilivadin reductase, it's going to form something called bilirubin which is further processed by the liver which we have discussed innumerable times already. So now once the Fe2 plus is formed, this is the ion is formed, again the fate of the ion let us discuss because this is only one source of ion for the macrophage or reticular nitrile system. There are a lot of other sources of ion are also there. The second source of ion which I want to talk is coming from the transport form, transported form. So in the form of transferrin or holotransferrin or diferic transferrin. So I have drawn two Fe3 plus molecules here. So these are Fe3 plus molecules. I have drawn two Fe3 plus molecules bound to a transferrin molecule. That's why it's called a diferic transferrin or a holotransferrin. We have specialized transferrin receptors that is present on the cell membrane one, which is typically having high affinity for taking up transferrin. So this is what we call as a transferrin receptor one or uh, you know, like this is the one that binds with the transferrin and endocytose the transferrin inside. So endocytose the transferrin inside. So once inside the endosome that is formed, your Fe2 plus is further converted to Fe2 plus, which means they are going to reduce, which means this steep 3 enzyme is going to do that here, which means this steep 3 is somewhat similar to the uh, I mean the ferroreductase what you have seen which means the steep 3 enzyme is somewhat similar to the cytochrome B or that ferroreductase enzyme you have seen in the uh, you know like intestinal absorption of iron. So once this Fe2 plus is formed it is moved out of the endosome and into the intracellular compartment of the cell and out of the endosome by again the same DMT1 which you have seen that is called a divalent metal transporter number 1. So this is the principle that is happening. Apart from this, again this, once this Fe2 plus is pushed out, it enters the common ion pool inside. Similarly, if you have other ways of how to take the ion outside, so for example, you have haptoglobin hemoglobin complex. Haptoglobin is going to trap the free hemoglobin molecules that is circulating in the blood. So free hemoglobin molecules generally, I mean, do circulate a little bit because normally itself some tearing of the RBCs might happen while passing into the circulation so that your hemoglobin may be released in free form. This free hemoglobin is actually quite dangerous. Why it's quite, quite dangerous? Because it can precipitate in the kidneys and can produce kidney injury. At the same time, since hemo free hemoglobin even has more affinity for oxygen, so they can trap so much of oxygen and they can, while passing through the circulation, they might cause a lot of oxidative damage because they carry oxygen along with them and uh, they get bombarded on the tissue. It's a free hemoglobin. Inside the RBC, it's fine. If it's free, it's going to bombard a lot of surfaces and it's going to cause oxidation related injuries because they carry oxygen. So free hemoglobin is dangerous. To In normal circumstances, there is one important protein called haptoglobin that is going to avoid this free hemoglobin from 
circulating so that it traps the hemoglobin whatever it's released immediately and it's going to push into the uh, RES system and RES has specialized sensing mechanism in the form of CD163 which transports the haptoglobulin and hemoglobin complex. Similarly, this hemopexin is the one that is going to bind free heme, note the point, it's free heme and it's not free hemoglobin. So once they sense this, I mean this free heme is there in the blood circulating, by some reason your hemopexin is goes, I mean, going to be trapping all this free heme. Trust me, this hemopexin is the only protein which has the maximum affinity for heme. If they ask you which protein in the body has maximum affinity for heme, answer must be this uh, hemopexin only. So this hemopexin also can be sensed by a com I mean, uh, surface molecule called CD91 which is going to transport this hemopexin into the cell. This hemopexin into the cell and it's taken up by the endosome. And finally, both this hemoglobin as well as heme is going to form finally ultimately heme molecules which again transferred out by the same HRG1. Heme means outside is HRG1, transport outside, which enters the common heme pool. At the same time, they will be further converted to iron, believed in and carbon monoxide, where again this iron enters the common iron pool. Similarly, once there are, now you can see the intracellular iron sources is coming from four things. One is maybe by erythrophagocytosis, second maybe by transport form of iron, third maybe by uh, haptoglobin hemoglobin complex or fourth maybe by hemopexin heme complex. So these are the four sources of this Fe2 plus that is coming into the cell. So again the fate of this Fe2 plus depends on I mean obviously your iron stores and epsilon levels. For example again the movement of iron outside this RES system is mediated by the same ferroprotein and ferroprotein molecule. So which means so there are two fates. One is your fate number one. So fate number one is followed if your ferroprotein is blocked. If your ferroprotein is blocked, your fate number one will be followed. When ferroprotein will be blocked, if you have a high circulating ion, which is going to release a lot of epsilon, which is going to block the ferroprotein, which means whenever you have high ion in the sense, which means they have to be stored in the form of ferritin, which means when you have a high circulating ion, means it's a time for storage, not for, I mean, putting again and again into the circulation and creating more problem. So this is what is going to happen. Similarly, when you have a low serum ion or low circulating ion, you will have a low hepsidin as a reflux and your ferroprotein will be released and which means a lot of ion is going to be moving out through the portal into the circulation, which means in low serum ion states, you need a lot of iron released from the storage. So for example, whenever there is low intracellular ion, your ferritin itself can be mobilized to form Fe2+, which can again be mobilized to, uh, I mean, uh, into the circulating pool, which means storage also can be sucked out from the RES in times of low iron, low circulating iron in the body. So these are some of the important things that you have to know. Once this Fe2+, come outside by some means, once this Fe2+, comes outside, it has to be further converted Fe3 plus because for transporting again you need Fe3 plus because Fe3 plus only can be transferred to target tissues because it has to be again transferred to target tissues which means the stored ion can be taken out and it can be transferred to target tissues only again by transferring. So again this transport is mediated by transferring. And who's going to convert this Fe2 plus by Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, it's the ceruloplasm, which is somewhat similar to your hepastin in the GAT or which is otherwise called as peroxidase. It is the ceruloplasm is the one that oxidates Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus here. And this is the one that uh, is very similar to the hepastin and your, uh, I mean, otherwise called as peroxidase that we have seen in the GAT. So this is what is going to happen. This is how an iron recycling happens in the first place. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from PrepLadder.